good. Brilliant. Well, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the webinar. Um, welcome to Nuclear Energy Insiders webinar with the, uh, the US Nuclear Industry Council and uh, the DNT Task Force and ACOM titled Decommissioning Strategy Evolution and Market Application. Uh, my name is Kevin Anderson and I'm the organizer for this webinar. Uh, as you may know already, I am responsible for the sixth annual Nuclear Decommissioning and Use Fuel Strategy Summit. Uh, in, uh, on the 30th of September and the 1st of October in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, this, is one, this webinar is one of a number of pieces of work we're doing to promote the industry and some of the key issues within it. We also have multiple white papers come up, which has just been released, so do watch out for that, um, which are available through our website. If you want to get in contact with me, I'm more than happy to send you a copy. Um, there are almost 250 of you signed up today, which is brilliant. So thank you very much for the great response in such a short turnaround time as well. And thank you in advance to both Lowry and Jay, um, for their time uh, to present today. Uh, just a quick bit of um, housekeeping before we begin. Uh, this webinar will be about 40 minutes-ish, um, um, then we'll have a Q&A session after. We do have a question function in the webinar software. Please do get involved and use that. It's a great way for you to um, communicate directly with the, uh, the panellists. Um, it's great when we have a lot of questions, really helps to foster a lot of discussion. And those questions that aren't asked, we will submit to the panellists um, after the webinar, we'll be able to email out those responses as well. So do get involved there. Um, the purpose of today's session uh, is really to take a closer look at current decommissioning strategies, um, what works well, what's good practice, uh, how they've evolved over time, mm -hmm. and how they're likely to evolve in the future. Um, joining me today to address some of the key issues are Larry Camper, he's the chair of the US um, NIC D&D Task Force, and Jay Brister, who is the VP of Nuclear Decommissioning at AECOM. With both um, both US NIC, d, &D Task Force, and ACOM um, speaking and presenting um, at the Nuclear Decommissioning and Use Fuel Strategy Summit in Charlotte um, on the 30th of September and the 1st of October, make sure to check out our website to find out what other senior makers will be um, will be joining them. Like I said, do get involved with that questions um, panel as much as possible, uh, and we will um, try and try and facilitate those questions as much as possible. Um, right, so without any further ado, I would love to think so, but I'm pretty sure people have not turned up to just hear me talk. Um, so without further ado, I will um, switch over to Larry, and um, Larry, off you go. Just switching over now. Okay, can you hear me, Kevin? Yes, I can. Good. Can everyone else out there hear me? Uh, they won't be able to say so, but I do believe they can. I'll let you know if they can. Okay. Very good. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, on behalf of the Nuclear Industry Council, or NIC, d, &D Task Force, I'm very happy to be with you this morning. Uh, Talisman International is a member of NIC, and I'm representing Talisman on NIC. Uh, what I wanted to do was cover a few things that we're working on in the d, &D Task Force at NIC. And I think what's important for you as you listen to this, whether it be NIC, or it be the American Nuclear Society, or it be NEI, the kinds of things we're working on really apply to all organizations interested in decommissioning. We're trying to increase the awareness and understanding of the current trends taking place in decommissioning. We're trying to clarify the NIC organizational positions to serve for education and engagement. And one of the things I think is terribly important today with all that is going on is education and sharing uh, our experiences and helping each other work through the decommissioning process. We want to facilitate decision making by industry and stakeholders, and we want to facilitate dialogue with legislative and regulatory representatives. Nick does an awful lot of that on the Hill on behalf of the industry, and so it's important that we monitor closely what's going on in decommissioning and to see what we can do to influence the Hill and the regulators. And then finally, we support activities and events to further NICS educational mission relative to nuclear power plant decommissioning. So we developed a task force, and what you see now on this slide and the next slide is things that this task force is focusing upon. The first is trends in the announcement of nuclear power plants. We've actually prepared a spreadsheet for use by NIC members, and um, the spreadsheet shows the status of the various uh, nuclear power plants in decommissioning. And more importantly, in recent times, of course, is the choice of a business model that's to be used for decommissioning, which Jay will cover in some detail during his presentation. Um, we're going to keep this up to date. Things will change. Uh, there may be other models that emerge over time. 
or hybrids of the existing models. And so we'll try to keep that up to date. And so then uh, clarifying and following what choices are undertaken by the nuclear power plants for D&D. We like to provide progress reviews for nuclear power plants undergoing D&D. Any new developments that might occur in techniques that are uh, being used for decommissioning and then regulatory developments impacting D&D, such as, for example, the ongoing NRC rulemaking to improve the decommissioning process, which has been delayed. And then I think it's terribly important that the group focus on lessons learned. We need to capture those lessons learned and draw upon them. And then finally, uh, global trends and regulatory development impacting D&D worldwide. Uh, Jay has some excellent information in his presentation that will show you the, the scope and magnitude of decommissioning worldwide. And so for companies involved internationally, you want to keep up with this. Professional conferences, which are focused upon D&D, of course, such as the one in Charlotte coming up. And then development of educational materials and public artifacts related to D&D in the interest of the NIC members. So that's what the task force is doing. I wanted to just cover that quickly. And now what I'm going to do is move over to a different set of slides that will give you some more substantive details about uh, decommissioning, uh, especially emphasizing what's new today. So this part of the talk is focused upon achieving success in decommissioning. And I share this information with you based upon my experience at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission where I was involved in, in, in you know, regulatory oversight for every plant that was decommissioned. And then what's been taking place since I left the agency and hopefully these ideas will be of use to you as you strive for success. First, to be successful in decommissioning, you have to have an established regulatory program that works. We do have that in the United States. Statutory authority has to be clearly enunciated there needs to be comprehensive regulations and associated cleanup criteria. We need to have useful, clear guidance, uh, a process based upon facility type. There's not only nuclear power plants being decommissioned, of course, but also complex material sites, uranium recovery sites. And so we have a, a plethora of guidance about the type of facility uh, being involved. Ideally, a risk-informed performance-based approach is useful. We have that. Uh, and the system that we use in the United States is quite different than is used internationally. And I would point out that you really need to understand the system uh, internationally at a country in which you may become involved if you are a decommissioning practitioner. Public awareness and involvement, I think we all understand the degree to which public awareness and involvement has increased in the last few years. Uh, we're seeing not only stakeholders and citizens task groups and the like want to be involved, but actually in some cases crying out for changes in regulatory infrastructure. So the public awareness and involvement is something you need to, to have involved. We have it in our system. It seems to be working pretty well. When you approach your decommissioning decision, I cite planning first, and you'll hear me use the term planning several times. When you decide to cease operations, you will file your certification that is required. You will prepare your post shutdown decommissioning activity report I think you need to maximize the use of the PSDAR. There are certain things that it must contain. There's a slide in a moment that will show you that. But the important point here to make is use the PSDAR to your advantage for good planning. Uh, once the fuel is removed from the RPV and placed into uh, the pool, another certification is required, then you're really going to be starting to think more and more about your timing and how do you want to decommission the facility. Stakeholder communications will take on an increasingly important role at that time. And I cannot overemphasize how much you must reach out to the stakeholders and communicate with them, because if you do not, it will cause challenges later. There will be some front-end changes that you have to deal with um, currently and until the NRC changes its uh, approach. That's dealt with through exemptions. Uh, someday it will be dealt with through the rulemaking process once it's completed. This graphic shows you the decommissioning process and a couple of points I would make. The decommissioning report that referred to here is the PSDAR, the Post Shutdown Decommissioning Activities Report. It is subject to NRC review but not approval. A public meeting notice is provided and the PSDAR is to be prepared before or within two years of cessation of operations. We go through decommissioning, use a risk and foreign performance-based approach, 
And then the license termination plan has to be submitted two years prior to the time which you want to have the license terminated or more than likely a reduction in the footprint to the independent spiritual storage installation. We go through final decontamination and a final survey. I think it's important to note here on the final survey, especially for utilities that are hiring companies to do this work for them, an understanding of how to develop a final status survey and conduct that survey is a terribly important thing to think about in your planning process. This slide simply depicts the content of the PSDAR. I won't belabor it so we can keep moving. But um, I would point out right here the role of the 5059 process. Once you have developed your PSDAR, there will be many things you can do early, especially early in the decommissioning process, but through the decommissioning process, where you can use the 5059 process to make changes that don't require an amendment to your license. So bear in mind how you may use the tool that 5059 provides for you. And you can expect public concern, questions, and doubt. Your license termination plan, the important point here is there were two I would make. One is that it's planning for end state. What will your site look like when decommissioning is completed, site characterization is completed, any dismantlement, and then finally, your final uh, survey plan. Um, using a site-specific cost estimate will be important. This is a supplement to your environmental report. Is anything that you're doing in decommissioning going beyond the bounds of the generic environmental impact statement for decommissioning? More than likely, it will not be. There may be a hearing. There may be a hearing. There's an opportunity for a hearing. Inspections will take place throughout the course of your decommissioning. The NRC uses a risk-based approach in conducting its inspections. In other words, activities that have the highest risk will be focused upon. And then, of course, there will be a final licensing action to conclude the decommissioning process. You will face a lot of challenges along the way. Real-time adjustments will take place. Communication is paramount. It, it looks like a beehive. A decommissioning facility looks like a beehive. You may find unexpected things, such as leaks or contaminated groundwater. You may have some issues needing to look for embedded pipe, for example. And then there will ultimately be in-process, side-by-side, final status survey. So it's going to be important that you, um, that you, the utility, or your contractor design an adequate final status survey and know that the NRC will conduct it side-by-side. -side. Uh, keeping uh, control of your samples and all of your data throughout the development of the survey and conducting the survey will be very important. Um, you, you must maintain awareness of your business model, whether you are choosing to do it as a utility yourself with the use of a contractor or you, you go to a model like the asset acquisition, you got to maintain awareness of the business model and so does your contractor. Um, there are a number of things along the way that can be dealt with, large components, package certification, transportation will come into play, the final status survey. And then I conclude with, again, the stakeholders, your state, your non-government organization and your public. There will be a need to focus upon organizational effectiveness, keep track of ongoing lessons learned. There will be NRC inspection findings along the way that you will have to react to. Sometimes those inspections go along very smartly with no problems, but sometimes there are issues. You'll have to address those in real time. I emphasize again the role and use of the 5059 process to make changes that can help you keep things moving in a timely manner. You will need a quality insurance program. You will need to focus upon your nuclear decommissioning safety culture. There will be employee concerns along the way. Remember, you have a lot of employees working, contractors and so forth. There will be concerns. You will need to have a plan to deal with them. You will also need a corrective actions program. And when you are submitting your license termination plan, it's a very good idea to meet with the regulator, meet with the NRC ahead of time and talk about the contents of your LTP and uh, make sure that that goes along smoothly for you. There will be many parts uh, that are moving along the way and many people. And finally, I would say that you do not know what you do not know. There will be surprises. Expect that. Um, it always happens and it will happen to you along the way as well. So anticipate that. So I think with that, uh, Kevin, I'm gonna, stop my slide presentation, stop my remarks, and let Jay take over from here. Thank you. No problem. Thank you very much, Larry. do appreciate that a lot. Um, keep those questions coming, guys. You can see a few of you asking questions now. 
Um, yeah, let's just keep them coming in. But once again, thank you very much, Larry, for that detailed presentation. Do much appreciate that. I will now swap over to Jay. Uh, Jay, I'm just changing you over to the presenter as of now. Um, you should be able to see that on your screen. There we go. And um, yeah, Jay, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. And um, thanks, everyone, for uh, for joining in. Um, so what I wanted what to do with you this morning is just kind of walk through um, kind of an overview of the the, the U.S. Uh, nuclear uh, power plant decommissioning market and uh, chat about uh, a few things. One, um, how did we get here? Um, and uh, I think that's an interesting discussion for us to understand why we're decommissioning plants uh, today um, ahead of the end of their license life. So let's kind of frame up uh, how we got here, look at today's market, um, take a look ahead to see what um, what our industry is facing from a decommissioning perspective. And, um, and, and given kind of the diverse um, uh, group of, of folks who are, are looking, this, uh, looking at this as a line of business, I wanted to share with you uh, some thoughts around, um, you know, what's in it for me? So what are the kinds of things that uh, a company like AECOM would be looking for as it's decommissioning a plant in a market. And then lastly, um, uh, for all of us, the strategic importance of decommissioning really today to our industry. Um, first, just, uh, you know, as, as Larry did, just a little bit of background on AECOM. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we've pretty much been in the business since there was a business going back to the de decommissioning of, of shipping port back in the, uh, the mid-80s. We've been continuously involved in uh, decommissioning reactors um, since then. So it's a, it's a business that we understand and are, are committed to uh, being a major player in. So, um, you know, today, uh, as I mentioned, there is a growing nuclear power plant decommissioning market. But I think for us to contextualize why there is a growing market today, we need to go back to 1999 and really set the stage uh, for why things are the, w the way they are today. And if we go back to 1999, let's, uh, let's go back a little bit. Um, uh, of course, in 1999, I think a lot of folks thought the, that the world was going to end at the, uh, at the end of the year. We saw Star Wars show up again. This thing called Pokemon showed up. This thing called Harry Potter showed up. And it looks like politics really hasn't changed since 1999. And, Goodness gracious, who is this guy from from twenty years ago? So, um, but but getting us back on track here, um, what really set the stage in, in nineteen ninety nine that's impacting us today is electricity market restructuring, and what we saw back in the, in the late nineties and through the mid two thousands were sections of the country highlighted in gray on this particular slide that migrated from a regulated utility uh, rate of return type of structure to um, uh, a retail choice environment. And what that, what that, what that created was, um, number one, a decision for these formerly regulated utilities to migrate uh, down one or two paths, one of two paths. One is they would be a service uh, provider and, and, and provide a, a wires business and distribution business uh, to transmit electricity. Or number two, they could be a generator of electricity. And the majority of these companies went down the, the wires business uh, and, and having a retail function to sell electricity. And uh, to go down that path, they had to divest themselves of their generating assets. So given the high concentration of nuclear plants uh, up in the Northeast, um, that resulted in, oh, I guess, Probably over a, a couple of dozen uh, nuclear plants um, winding, finding themselves on the market and being sold. In a former life, um, that's what I used to do was acquire nuclear power plants from my company. And back, uh, you know, I would say from 1999 until about 2005 or so, I actually had the opportunity to go in and do, do, do due diligence on every one of these plants on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, as a as a potential um, acquisition uh, from our company, um, so uh, the the market itself is is taking about fifteen percent of the the total uh, nuclear industry just from number of plants and migrating it out of this 
this structured regulated utility uh, environment into a merchant uh, generator uh, environment. So by merchant, I just mean these plants are strictly there to sell. They make a product. They make electricity. They make their they make their profit off of the difference between what they can sell their product for and what their cost to produce that product is. Um, so that's that was the business. And in the 90s, uh, starting back in the late 90s, uh, that was uh, the way uh, the big portions of the country were moving. Actually, I think since then, some of the some of the states uh, in the upper right here have actually gone back to a regulated form of service. But what we saw over the last 20 years really is industry consolidation into a handful of key players where uh, a big chunk of the nation's nuclear plants are consolidated in a handful of a handful of owners. So that kind of sets the stage for uh, for what was going on with the nuclear industry. But when we look at that time period of, of 20 years. Um, it's 20 years that really changed nuclear power. Because if you look at, uh, I would say, our, our, com our competing fuel type um, uh, in the market uh, uh, being natural gas, we've seen um, quite the shift in natural gas prices over the last couple of decades. So in the late, uh, I mean, excuse me, in the early 2000s, we saw a big drop in, in the price of natural gas. And again, Near the end of that decade, we saw the same thing. But what's interesting, just to maybe to digress just a little bit, is this uh, kind of magic window of six to eight dollars a million BTU uh, of natural for, for natural gas pricing, and that's the magic window uh, above which uh, new nuclear is competitive. So you can kind of see throughout the 2000s that um, the nuclear renaissance it was driven by the the you know, the competitive nature of nuclear in that environment against some significantly high prices that we saw in natural gas. You can also see why as we're going into the 2010s and moving forward, the reliance on large-scale nuclear from a cost-competitive nature began to wane, and you saw a lot of those new plants are announced being, being halted. But I think of more significance in relative to our discussions today are what you see over here on the far lower right. Um, and that is this kind of precipitous drop beginning in about 2013 of natural gas prices. Um, so if you just kind of did an average of that and, and you would have a pretty, pretty steep downward slope on natural gas prices. Um, and this one looks like it's winding up on the right hand side at about $3. Actually, where we sit today, we've got uh, gas prices just uh, a little bit over two dollars a million BTU, um, and with 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 no driver to make that move up in the foreseen future. So, what was the impact of that on our industry? So, really, you know, this precipitous drop in in, in gas prices. There's another curve that, if you drew it, would would show a, a complete opposite slope, slope, and that would be the output of the Marcellus shale field which has gone up tremendously over the same time frame. And of course, this drop in natural gas prices affected those merchant plants. So if I go back and look at those merchant plants that uh, I did due diligence on, 50% of them today have either shut down or announced that they're going to shut down. So this, this merchant fleet of nuclear plants in our country is really creating um, uh, uh, an early onset of decommissioning in the country um, that is going to have to be addressed by by the industry on a going forward basis. Um, and then the, the remaining plants, um, I think probably with the exception of, of Point Beach and Seabrook on this slide, have had some form of legislation or a strong PPA put in place to ensure they're going to run uh, for the extended future. So. Still a couple more plants here that with, with questions about, but really when you look back and look at what, what happened to our industry, we were really creating, an, an uh, I'll call it an early onset of deconditioning just from uh, kind of market conditions in, in the electricity uh, market that got us to this point. So that kind of sets the stage for where we are. So when we go back and look at today's market, it's definitely an evolving decommissioning market. Um, so as Larry mentioned earlier, I'll, I'll kind of run through the models that we're seeing in the marketplace today. So you've got, you know, a, a self-performed model uh, for, for decommissioning. So, um, you know, going back, looking at Maine Yankee is one of the first, I'll call it, you know, in quote, 
modern, you know, large scale decommissioning projects that, that took place um, on, on a large unit in Humboldt Bay, which is, which is ongoing and close to wrapping up. Um, there's a decommissioning general contractor approach where the majority of the D and D tasks are contracted to a third party, and for example, that's uh, what's what's occurring at Songs, and that's uh, you know AECOM and Energy Solutions have formed uh, Songs decommissioning solutions and are taking that route at that plant. Um, there's a licensed stewardship model. I like to call this kind of a risk optimized model from a D and D delivery company perspective, and that's where um, the license is transferred to I would say to uh, a company to take over uh, the, the license operator responsibilities. The license owner though will retain the fuel and uh, it allows that license operator to kind of have a full play in, uh, in the approach to decommissioning the plant. And a couple of examples there are Zion and La Crosse. But earlier this year, we saw the, the, the first you know, financial transaction close of an asset transfer model. And that's where um, one of these previous uh, merchant plant owners basically sells the whole asset to a new company who will take the license, the equity, and the assets, and now is responsible on a going forward basis for everything associated with that plant. So the decommissioning, um, the decommissioning trust fund, as well as the, the, the long-term liability for the used nuclear fuel that's on site. So in January, Vermont Yankee uh, crossed that, that line uh, as the first plant to do that. And uh, just uh, uh, last week, I believe, uh, the Oyster Creek um, license was transferred to Holtec, and that's still pending a, a transactional close. So we've got to definitely an evolving uh, decommissioning market um, that is dynamic. So Again, if we take kind of those plants and, and reconfigure them, this is a great little graph that the Energy uh, Information Administration put together in one of their press releases. Um, you can kind of see those, those plants that have announced the shutdown just across a, a, a simple little timeline. And on the left, we've got the plants that are kind of ongoing uh, decommissioning with this uh, San Onofre, Crystal River, um, and VY. Kiwani is in Safe Store. And then as we look to the right there, you see the the, the darker shaded units are, are all uh, in, in some form or fashion associated with a, with a whole tech uh, transaction. None of those have closed yet. Three Mile Island announced that it will be closing uh, uh, in, in uh, this year. And then Dwayne Arnold has formally announced that they're closing at the end of 2020. And then um, just following the continuing um, efforts at, at state level to see how the Ohio and Pennsylvania plants are going to fare. These are the first energy plants and um, uh, watching to, to see how those are going to eventually uh, survive or not based on um, their current PPA structures, their current cost structures, and whether or not there are some legislative actions that are going to provide some value recognition for nuclear um, in the marketplace. And then you've got Diablo Canyon in 2024 and 2025, who are going to shut down at the end of their 40-year license life. Um, so... You know, as we look at this as a market, what that means, you see on the right-hand side of your screen here, I mean, this in the short term is like a 15 to $20 billion um, market um, that is going to be just growing uh, from where we sit today in 2019 uh, across, uh, across, excuse me, across this decade. So if we look ahead, and, and I took the opportunity to kind of do some forecasting myself to see if all of those plants on that previous graph actually went into decommissioning and using some kind of market intelligence around who's going to who's going to make it and who might not make it, um, just a simple forecast to kind of see what will the next decade and into the early part of the next day look like look like to our industry when it comes to uh, decommissioning activities in the country. So you can see about the time we hit the middle of the 2020s. It's a very active decommissioning market in the country. And if you kind of cut across all those blue lines, and if I looked at kind of an average of $100 million a year as a spend on a, on a decommissioning project, um, it's, you know, it's, it's anywhere from 800 to uh, a billion dollars just being spent in 2026. So you can see the kind of the magnitude of the spend and the size of the market that we're, we're looking at on a going forward basis. 
And then you can see how that will really curtail by the time we go into, into the early 2030s um, if, if other things um, are, are not uh, going to unfold on a going forward basis. And you pretty much get all these units back down to an asphyxiation um, configuration. But that's really not the case as we look ahead, because if you look at our industry, um, when we go into the 2030s, as opposed to, you know, only a dozen reactors uh, uh, shutting down uh, in this decade of the 20s, um, I think the market size is going to be closer to four or five times that on a going forward basis into the 2030s and 2040s. So the market itself is going to uh, expand rapidly as we get into the 2030s and looking forward. And we find ourselves uh, today in a position where we've, we've got some opportunities to step into this new part of our industry um, that's going to be expanding. It really is the largest nuclear market in the United States um, on a going forward basis based on current business uh, conditions in the country. And it's, it's also something I'll talk about a little bit later that is of strategic importance to the whole business, to the whole industry. So uh, I think a lot of you are very interested in, so what does this mean to me um, as a supplier of services for uh, nuclear power plant decommissioning? So if I just take a you know ballpark, like let's just say ballpark, you know, 800 megawatt pressurized water reactor, you know, generically, when, when I look at one of these projects, it's, it's about a $600 million job just to do the D&D piece of it. And you kind of see how the costs break down. I mean, about a third of it, you know, ballpark, which is gonna be waste, it's going to be about $100 million to get you from a shutdown, transitioned over into kind of full-scale decommissioning. Um, there's about $50 million uh, that's going to be set aside just to deal with your greater than class C waste. So those portions of the you know, vessel, vessel internals that, uh, that don't have a, don't have a long-term home in the country yet, that will just have to be put in dry storage containers and kept on the storage island. And then you've got a, a, about another third um, or, and a little bit more that's really focused on the D&D &D aspects of the business. And about $30 million of that $250 million is focused around equipment rental and the rest is really labor. But it's labor around a broad spectrum um, of services that are required to decommission one of these power plants. So when I look at subcontracting, um, it's really uh, it is going to be dependent upon the model that's used by the by the owner by the licensee, um, the the self perform or the license stewardship uh, asset transfer kind of models will give some flexibility in subcontracting. Um, pretty much the licensee is in control of everything, and uh, they will uh, determine how they want to contract that work. Uh, a DGC model, uh, for example, like at Songs, usually includes two layers of subcontracting. So the, the, the owner is still the licensee, remains with the utility, and um, there will be some you know, subcontracting opportunities that are just going to stay with them. So, for example, you know, Songs, we've got the D&D &D scope, but they also did separate subcontracts for the spent fuel island. There was some site characterization work, a cold and dark subcontract, and then the um, Asphyxia fuel transfer operations contract was left. And another thing in a, in a DGC kind of model, um, you know, as a supplier, you'll, you'll need to be aware of, of flow downs uh, that will probably come from, if, if I'm looking for those services, there'll be flow downs from my prime contract down to uh, subcontractors. And in some cases, the, the owner uh, will want to approve some key subcontractors and of course the responsibilities uh, and, and flow downs will, will wrap around and then into um, intellectual property and of course insurance provisions. But what I wanted to share with you is just, you know, I won't go through this in a lot of detail, but just, just some data points on, on potential subcontracts that when you look at what's it take to go decommission a nuclear power plant, there is a broad spectrum of services that, um, that are required uh, to decommission one of these plants and it's an opportunity for uh, the larger companies or the, the licensees to um, engage with the with the industry to deliver the work. So I'll just linger on the, this slide here just a little bit longer to let you get a look at this. So it is a you know from from large to, to small, but it's 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 also um, supply of services from very uh, technically savvy uh, and specialized companies 
to down to uh, kind of I'll call it just basic blocking and tackling to uh, facilitating um, a, a construction project. So there is a lot of work to do on each of these, and there's a lot of involvement in the industry to help help us collectively decommission one of these plants. So um, kind of after looking at the market and kind of what we see going on in the market and, and what the opportunities might look like and the magnitude of that, um, I want to ground this with uh, some thoughts around why is this so strategically important to the nuclear power uh, industry today? And, and, and to wrap up with you, it's, it's, you know, as an industry, of course, you've got the operational backbone that's here. You've got a, a fleet of nuclear power plants, the largest fleet of nuclear power plants in the country that's running at levels, uh, you know, in, in the low 90s uh, as from capacity factors as an industry. And it, as the industry itself, we're working very hard to, to look at what our next, next technology is going to be to move our industry forward. Because we, we really don't want to fade away with this current generator generation of plants. And there are major efforts and a whole lot of money being spent to develop SMRs, advanced reactors, as well as deploying our, our Gen 3 nuclear power plant uh, designs. And our efforts in supporting nuclear power plant decommissioning today, which I mentioned earlier, really is the biggest market in the U.S. and in the future is going to directly impact decisions on deploying the next generation of plants. Because if we don't safely on schedule and on budget deliver these nuclear uh, power plant decommissioning projects, um, it, it, it can further encumber the decommissioning, excuse me, the, the decision uh, of potential new plant owners to pursue nuclear uh, as an option. So to, to, to finalize, I guess, my, my thoughts on this, it's, you know, our continued focus on safety is number one, the delivery of all of our services in an on schedule and on budget approach is just fundamental to our industry you know, to demonstrate to, to those that like to throw rocks at us that this is uh, uh, an industry that's very capable, it is very dependable and can be relied on as a safe, secure and clean energy source for decades to come. And with that, I'll go back to you, Kevin. Excellent, thanks very much, Jay, appreciate that. Um, really detailed there, actually, I really enjoyed that. Um, we've actually had a lot of questions come in. So yeah, I'd like once again, thank you, Jay and Larry, for your time um, uh, for your time presenting. However, yes, like I said, we've had a few questions come in of which I really wanted to, uh, to ask of you guys. So firstly, uh, first one's for you, Jay, actually. Uh, this comes from uh, Rod Bolter, and he said, Jay, on the $50 million for the GTCC, um, does that include future storage costs or just the cost to put it into storage on the ISPC? Um, does the utility recruit, re recoup any of the future storage costs um, from the government like they do for spent fuel? Um, that that cost is just getting the, the GTCC, um, you know, um, on the pad, and it's not including the going forward cost. So it's just the point to get you to uh, plan the plant So it's, it's, so it's not it's not it's, it doesn't include the going forward cost, and okay. um, it does not include the going forward cost. Okay, cool, good stuff, good stuff. Thanks for that, Jay. Appreciate that. Um, uh, second one's for you, Larry. Um, is there a push for any indemnification of the nuclear risk once the NRC releases a site for unrestricted use? Is there an indemnification? Was that the question? Yeah, is there a push for uh, any indemnification of the nu nuclear risk once the NRC releases a site for unrestricted use? No, I don't, I don't believe so. Uh, what happens is the NRC uses a very conservative criteria. That's the 25 millirem and Alara standard. And in fact, most of the sites that, that undergo decommissioning end up in a few millirem. So the risk profile that results from a successful decommissioning is indeed very minimal. But in the NRC's process, once the license termination uh, is issued, or more than likely a reduction in footprint, from the regular leader standpoint, it's game over at that point, and the land can be used for any purpose given that it's met the um, release criteria in subparty of Part 20. 
Okay, good stuff. Thanks for that, Larry. Um, interesting. Good. Uh, we've had another question coming, actually, which I think is really interesting. Um, it says, I think this is for the both of you, and um, it'd be good to get an opinion from, from both of you on sort of why you think this is the case. Why do you think that um, Diablo, Cam uh, Diablo Canyon has an estimated decommissioning cost of almost $5 billion, it's $4.8 billion, while there are some East Coast plants that are closer to $1 billion per reactor? Jay, do you want to start off with that one, and then we'll go over to Larry? Uh, well, I guess I, it, it, it's, I don't have the, the data in front of me uh, to look at, but, but I would say that one, uh, one noted difference um, that, that you can see, for example, at it, it, San Onofre, um, when you, when you look at East Coast plants, uh, a lot, uh, the majority of those all um, look at decommissioning uh, and take uh, the, the plant itself uh, down to three feet below grade. And then uh, there's backfill and covered over. And then as long as you meet uh, your, your requirements, the site can be released. Um, if, for example, I know that at, at San Onofre, when you look at that total cost estimate, um, it looks at the removal of all of the subsurface structures as well. So there's a, 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 an additional scope of work, uh, again, that's, that's complicated. It, it, it expands the, you know, really the construction aspect of what you're doing by going below grade, removing large amounts of concrete from below grade. Um, uh, to to wrap up that project. So, um, without having any other details in front of me, I would just I would just state that though that is one major difference that you see uh, between a, a plant in California and say a plant back east. Okay, cool. I, I would add, yeah, I would add to that the the other difference is, and, and Jay just touched upon it really is that it's California. What you're going to find. At the end of the day, once all the plants in California have been successfully decommissioned, you will find that the cost was greater than would be the case on the East Coast. And that really has to do with two things, higher expectations in California in terms of its regulatory infrastructure and, and the fact that the waste, any waste from these facilities being decommissioned have to be handled in a certain way as a as a result of the executive order issued by Governor Gray Davis several years ago. So it costs more to decommission in California, and that will be the case for every planet, I believe. Okay, interesting. That's really interesting to hear about that um, executive order, actually. Um, does, that, does that kind of relate to the idea that California eventually want to ship their waste out of the state altogether? Are those two things quite separate? Well, you well, well actually, going on. Uh, go ahead, Jay. Go ahead. Well, no, I was going to. Well, I guess I'm probably going to say the same thing you're right. It's kind of it's kind of twofold. One is, um, you know, uh, waste, just clean waste, as well as low level, um, all all of the waste, with the exception of of nuclear fuel and, and the greater than class C waste, has to leave the state. So that's another dynamic I think that you'll find uh, different um, in California more so than the East Coast as well. Yeah, and the point there is whether it's contaminated or not, the fact is that it came from right. the facility being decommissioned. That's uh, most unusual as compared to other uh, states and, and their requirements. Right. Okay. Interesting. Didn't didn't know about that. That's really interesting. Um, Larry, this is one for you. Bit of a bit of a change of um, change of tack, I think. But so you kind of went over decommissioning best best practice there. But um, in terms of sort of looking further afield in the U.S., um, in terms of other countries, what other countries do you feel offer good guidance on best practice? Are there other other sort of processes or ways things are done in other countries which you think are a sort of a gold standard or something that um, uh, the industry in North America could learn from? Well, I think there's always the opportunity to learn from other countries and their regulatory processes. Um, you know, there is decommissioning, quite a bit of decommissioning going on internationally. And so certainly uh, one can learn from that. The World Nuclear Organization Association, I think it is, has a lot of information it puts together. So yes, we can learn from them just as they can learn from us. But I do think that one thing, there are two things that come to mind when you look at decommissioning internationally. 
In many cases, waste disposal is challenging as compared to the good fortune that we have in the United States, having the four commercial operating facilities that we have, and especially the role that the uh, site in Utah plays and the site in Texas can play. You know, there are constraints via our system because of the compacts and so forth, but but we are very fortunate as compared to our colleagues in, in other countries. And some of those waste disposal problems haven't been resolved yet. But they've had successes in decommissioning, and so yes, we can learn from them. The other point that I would make, and I touched on it briefly in my comments earlier, it's very important if you're a U.S. company and you want to partake in the decommissioning arena abroad, whether it be Asia or Europe, you must understand the system is different than what you're accustomed to here. For example, many of those countries uh, require that you obtain a license to decommission your facility, uh, just as you did to operate your facility. And you're going to go through the regulatory process, but that carries with it and have to interface with the regulators and so forth. And it's quite onerous uh, as compared to our system. So one of the things you might look at from a lessons learned standpoint is what kinds of questions was the regulator in those countries asking of the applicant that was proceeding into decommissioning so you can be forewarned ahead of time as to the kinds of questions that you're probably going to be faced with and so you can structure your answers accordingly. And it will be variable. It will, you know, it's just because it's true in one country is not the same in another country. So you'll need to do your homework, but that's an opportunity for lessons learned from abroad, plus the various decommissioning techniques that they're bringing to bear that they've used successfully is an opportunity to learn as well. Jay, coming from hey, the- Kevin? Yeah, Jay. I was gonna say, can I, can I add on to that? Yeah, definitely, I was just about to ask you, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, I think, I think Larry hit the nail on the head. You know, one of the, one of the biggest, biggest challenges internationally is, is waste disposition. But when, I, when, when you look at what, what's, what does that mean when it comes to decommissioning a plant, uh, it, it means that these international owners, their, their focus is on, on rad waste minimization. So they, they're not afforded the luxury of having a, you know, a, a disposition pathway like we have in the country. So it, it's, a, it's a very different approach to doing the, the physical work all around rad waste minimization, maximization of, of recycling, um, uh, you know, not just metals, but concrete, everything, um, because there's, there's no place to put this. So it really changes, uh, you know, the overall approach to the physical work. Another dynamic is, uh, and I would say in the majority of the cases internationally, just the workforce is how the utility uses its workforce is very different. If you look, for example, at the Vermont Yankee transaction, um, these are merchant plants that are going into decommissioning now. It, it's all it's a, it's an asset that used to produce a revenue and no longer produces a revenue. Now it's all cost. So in the U.S., there's this very um, uh, you know structured uh, I call it a, aggressive approach to reducing cost after the plant shutdown. That's really tied to your your um, regulatory actions to eliminate, uh, you know, requirements. It's tied to the closure of your, your Zerk fire window, but there's a stair stepping over a few years that can, you know, takes, you know, five or 600 people down to, um, less than, uh, less than 25. Um, and I think, you know, the, you know, the, the own, the new owners are, are, are hiring the maximum extent possible to keep that, uh, that knowledge of the plant with them as they go forward. But, you know, from a seller perspective, I think when you saw the Vermont Yankee transaction information, I think there were only 13 employees left at the plant at the time the transaction actually closed. Now contrast that to, to Germany, where the whole workforce is still there. So it's, it's a very, very, again, different approach to the work, how the work gets done, who's doing the work, and it, it makes for a, a, a you know, a, a, there is a U.S. approach, and then there is an international approach, and there's a country-specific approach. And uh, I think when you couple the the way the work has to be accomplished, given the the context of that country, and as Larry mentioned, the the regulatory wrap that goes around that, which is going also going to be different from the way the U.S. 
there's a there's a lot of uh, understanding required um, to step into one of these markets to to be able to perform work. And again, I would say the other the last thing I'd add on to this one is all work uh, all work all this work is local. So um, I think you'll find too when you get into some of these more uh, specifics in in delivering um, specific scopes of work. Um, being fluent in the language, whether it's Swedish or German or or, uh, or French or Spanish, um, it's going to be a requirement to, to make you uh, successful in, in being able to deliver that work as well. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Um, so just kind of, I know you said obviously, so there's quite a lot of regulatory barriers and barriers and kind of a lot of like country specific challenges in order to, to 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 say get into the international market. But is it something that you think would potentially be feasible for someone like ACOM or do you feel like those barriers are too high for really people to start jumping from country to country? No, no. I mean, it's, it, again, it's, it's the, it's, it's engaging the, the capabilities you have to provide the solution to the, the country's specific needs. And I think that the key there is really understanding what your value is in a particular market and how you can help your, your decommissioning customers in that specific country achieve the results that they're looking for that's that's really the key thing um and 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 that's what we're doing globally so if you just uh notice you know last monday we we just announced uh, our ongoing relationship with with Toshiba and uh the pursuit of the decommissioning market then in japan and being able to engage both the u.s government and the japanese government to help us to help us do that so it's it's that broader approach and really understanding uh, the market specific needs. Uh, I think that uh, don't make it an insurmountable task, but it's a, uh, it's a, uh, you know, I'll say, you know, being from Mississippi, I'll say it's a harder road to hoe than uh, than trying to do work domestic. <laughs> Kevin, may I add something to that point? Of course, uh, yeah, carry on. Yeah, you know, in Jay's presentation, he showed you the the. U.S. marketplace, well, you have to step back for a moment and ponder the fact that the international marketplace is estimated somewhere on the order of $120 billion. Uh, we prepared a white paper, which Jay was instrumental in, in fact, for our uh, group with Nick. And one of the things we looked at was that that number. And so my point is, while while countries tend to be centric to their locale, whether it be Asia or Europe, and the role of the workforce, as Jay pointed out in his comments, is, becomes paramount because that's the way their system works. But $120 billion worth of work is a lot of work. And somebody's going to have to do it. And so I would encourage U.S. companies, therefore, to target those markets abroad and to fully understand the system that they'll be having to deal with as they try to be competitive and win contracts abroad. It, there are challenges. But it certainly can be done, but you've just got to know the system that you're going to interface with. Yeah, so thanks, said, Larry. Brilliant. Um, one, one last question here, uh, which I think is quite an interesting one uh, for both of you. We'll start with Jay, but then we'll go to Larry. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes left to do make it quick, guys. Um, so can you share your insights on any specific issues or concerns for a multi-unit site where one unit is undergoing decommissioning? while another is not. For example, Millstone 1 versus Millstone 2 and 3, or at TMI where units 1 and 2 are owned by separate companies. I, I guess, you know, my perspective on that w would be, um, uh, of course, the last thing you want to do when you're decommissioning a plant on an active generating site is, is impact the operations of that facility. That just requires a tremendous amount of coordination between you as the decommissioning company and um, the company that's operating assets there. So, for example, I mean, that's something that has been ongoing. For you. If you look at La Crosse, um, that unit is is on the same site as the largest uh, generating uh, source for Dairyland Power. So, of critical importance to Dairyland was uh, the uh, the continued operation of their of their largest unit um, that'll be another uh, another example will be um, Crystal River which is also on an active generating site um, down in Florida so the, the work that, that that will take place there will have to, to do that delicate dance between um, how you set up schedule uh, and deliver your work 
lined up with uh, the plants that are co-located on the same site with you and integrating their work plans into your work plans will just be a component of what has to be done to ensure both parties get the, their desired outcomes safely. Yeah, I think TMI represents the example per excellence. I mean, you, you have two things to think about. One is administrative. You have two corporate entities involved, First Energy and GPUN, because of how that was separated years ago to uh, address the issues associated with TMI uh, two, and then and then um, there's a lot of interface between an active ongoing facility and one that's in a condition like um, as is the case at TMI. I mean, there's security interface, there's red monitoring, uh, there's operational surveillance requirements, um, water management, for example and um, simply reactor building entries. So there's a lot of interface that goes on between, you know, an operating facility and one that's shut down or one that's shut down, especially in the condition of in the case of TMI. So yeah, there's, there's a need to pay close attention to those interfaces as well as understanding what corporate differences there might be as you strive to win a decommissioning contract. Excellent. Thank you very much, Larry. Thank you very much, Jay. I think that's all we've actually got time for, guys. I want to, to give a big thanks to everybody who's actually attended the webinar today, um, and a big thanks to Larry and Jay for your time. I think everyone will agree that you're not only your presentations, but then the, um, the Q&A at the end has been really interesting there, so thank you to you both. Um, thank you. Just, no problem. Uh, just thank quickly... You. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, just quickly, yeah, just uh, to let everyone know that um, we've actually got a lot, a lot of questions here, um, but unfortunately we won't be able to ask them. However, the best way to get these, ask, these questions asked in, in the correct amount of detail would actually just to be to attend the Nuclear Decommissioning and Use Fuel Strategy Summit um, 2019 on the 30th of September and the 1st of October in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, not only do we have US NIC and AECOM there, but we've got basically all the biggest names in the business, Entergy, PG&E, Duke Energy, XL Energy, Energy Solutions, Arano, Westinghouse, um, and loads, loads more. We've even got a little bit of international representation from Sweden, a Swedish utility called Vattenfall will be attending, um, CNL from Canada, Canada Nuclear Laboratories will be attending, and the um, Japanese Atomic Energy Agency uh, will also be attending as well. So, um, yeah, do not miss it. It's a great opportunity. Uh, definitely should not be missed. You will have access to all the full audio replay and presentations um, by next week. I'll make sure I get those sent out. Um, do do dish them out to everybody that you know. It'd be great for us to spread as much knowledge and support for the industry as much as possible. Once again, thank you very much, Larry and Jay, for for participating. Thank you everyone for listening, and um, we'll see you soon. Thanks, guys.